Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners. Today's guest is Rochelle Chopamba. Rochelle is the Senior Vice President of HR for Amea for Astellas. Uh, Rochelle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris, for inviting me to your show. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Good to have you. Um, Rochelle, fill in the gaps. Tell um, our, our listeners a little bit more about yourself and uh, your journey to becoming the Senior Vice President of HR within the Cellus. Okay. Um, I started my career quite obviously 20 odd years ago in a retail organization called Woolworths in South Africa, and, but not in HR roles, in operational roles. Through that experience of managing people, um, you know, which is really about you know, the, the real emphasis on making sure that people are treated as assets, it became clear that I wanted to do a, a role in HR rather than just be in the business. So I then moved on to Unilever where I did my first uh, real HR job in the South African business at the time. And then I later moved to the global headquarters in London where I, I dabbled in a number of global roles. Um, the Unilever environment, I would say, is probably, for me as an HR professional, been the most amazing experience where I learned a hell of a lot and I sharpened uh, myself as an HR professional um, with that company. And I would say that was the, the core of my development as an HR professional. Of course, in my time at Unilever, I did a number of roles, predominantly in the centers of excellence um, and later on doing some strategic business partnering roles. I then got a little bored uh, at this fantastic <laughs> company, but I got a bit bored. And so I joined a, um, a, a consumer packaging and manufacturing company called Rexham, a very small organization or significantly smaller than Unilever. But I kind of felt that I wanted to go and test out if I could apply all the great world-class stuff I learned at Unilever in a very different context. This was quite a rewarding experience because I, I, I soon, you know, I, whilst I outgrew my strategic imperative of being there, you know, I, it was a great rewarding experience because what I learned from that experience is that I could actually deliver world-class HR professional um, solutions at a very low cost uh, mm -hmm. and in a very simple way rather than doing it in the way a Unilever would do it. Of course, I, I then joined GSK. And really what attracted me to GSK was the fact that I wanted to be part of an organization that, you know, did something more than, you know, I would say really making a tangible difference to people's lives in terms of the outcome of what the company did. Um, and I guess I was then attracted to Astellas, you know, with the same spirit because it's a much more niche organization that offers a lot more breadth and greater flexibility than the more established organizations like Unilever um, or GSK. But most importantly for me, you know, I, I guess this goes with age um, and with respect to business outcomes, it has a very personal essence and a much closer to home meaning for me on a personal level. And that's the oncology portfolio in, in our business. My father died of prostate cancer and we didn't know enough about it. And so I really had a very strong personal connection with being at the forefront of, of helping organizations, you know, forging and coming up with future possibilities, you know, in terms of outcome prevention and cure. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has a very personal meaning to me. I guess that, that's how I would summarize. It's a very interesting <laughs> journey. It's very, a yeah, very, very interesting journey. And it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic that you found that personal connection to your career which I suppose, you know, is what gets you up in every morning and, 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 and helps you drive towards success, um, which a lot of people um, don't have, you know, and I suppose, and, I, and there's no, there's no uh, coincidence that you've made it to where you are now having that driving factor behind it. So going back a second to what you said earlier, what, so why HR then? What, what compels you to, to jump into the HR profession? Well, I guess in my time in retail, um, you know, I pretty much, I was a line management role. So, you know, I, I was a manager of the textiles department. I was a store manager of a small store. I opened new stores. And I guess what I learned when I was working as store manager of, of quite a small store in a very difficult uh, South African context, um, what I had to do was really turn that store around. And in turning that store around, I really learned that 
It's about engaging with people, motivating them, listening to your staff and understanding what really makes the difference. And so it was about employee engagement uh, and culture of the organization. When I opened a new store, it was all about having the right profile of people in the organization. And so recruitment was critical, training people to be able to deliver and to, you know, into the organization. So it's really that connection of, yes, I was in a front-facing role, business operational role, but really what I loved most about that job was the people aspects. And that's what inspired me to, to really go into HR. Fantastic. So you, you almost lived you lived it in action and saw it in action and then saw that's where I want to be, which is, which is, which is pretty cool actually. Cause it's quite an unconventional way to shift into HR by being conscious of your own surroundings to know, look, this is somewhere I can make a difference. And this is yeah. something that's very interesting to me. So fantastic. So moving forward to where we are now, what really occupies your mind on the day to day basis? <laughs> <laughs> where, to start? where to start and focus. <laughs> where to start i probably get up every day thinking what am i going to prioritize and how am i going to stay focused because at the moment in the role that i'm in it's, it's just there's so much to do mm. and you really have to be very clear about how you're going to optimize your time but not just not just your own time but but equally when when you're thinking about how, how to optimize prioritize and focus uh, it's always done at the expense of something else. Mm. And so I think what's always top of mind as I go through my day and, and working here at Estellas is being overt with the choices I make in terms of what am I going to focus on for myself personally, but equally, what do I want the team to focus on? And whilst I don't do that on a daily basis, um, you know, I, I, by being more overt, helping my team understand where am I going to spend my time and energy, why I'm going to do that, and equally helping them make choices and linking it to what's our, arguably our strategic imperative and our drive, because we can get bogged down with a lot of the mundane activity and sometimes get sidetracked. Mm -hmm. But for me, the single biggest thing on my mind every day is prioritization and focus, mm. because I could do many things. No, of course, I can. I can certainly. I can. I can only. Ima I suppose I've never been there, of course, but I can only imagine <laughs> you know, on the scale that you're operating that. So, what kind of practical advice then would you give to HR other HR leaders? How do you separate, you know, to, uh, must do and you know, nice to have? <laughs> uh, on 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 the other hand, how do you how do you go about approaching that? Yeah. Well, I guess. For me, I'm always thinking at the 10,000 foot view and saying, well, what's the bigger purpose of what I'm doing? And can I see how what I'm doing today, yes, whilst it may be a short term action and activity, can I connect it to the bigger purpose? Uh, or does it matter? You know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of HR professionals that I think we try to fight every battle. Hmm. And quite frankly, it's not necessary. Sometimes it's about being more choiceful and saying, well, okay. I understand that if I did this process this way, it would be world class, but sometimes it, you know, it's more of a distraction. And if, if you can't connect what you're doing to the bigger picture, then sometimes you might have to make some trade-offs and how much time and effort you spend in that activity really is, is what should help and guide you. But mm -hmm. ultimately my advice is don't fight every battle make sure that the choices that of the things you're focusing on can connect to the bigger picture and help you drive where you're trying to get to as an organization. And for me, the strategy of the business is the beacon that keeps me focused. Mm -hmm. So always stepping back and looking at the bigger picture and the bigger needs of the organization. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so could you share, obviously you've been on such an amazing journey, different organizations, different cultures, different sizes, etc. Could you share one transformation or project that you've delivered that you're, that you're, that you're most proud of? Um, well, I guess there's quite a few. Um, the one that, that really stands out for me is, um, uh, in my time at Unilever where I, you know, I was part of, visioning and setting up the HR Academy at mm -hmm. Unilever. That was a global academic academy. And I did this at a time of a critical transitional uh, period where HR as a function was tr transforming itself. And, you know, just being able to, to orchestrate, you know, the underlying HR career framework um, that was obviously embedded at the time and, and is still used is just 
critical and one that I'm particularly proud of being an HR professional. Yes, I do my job daily, but to have actually done a job where what I was part of doing is actually creating something that could help develop other HR practitioners was just for me such an amazing opportunity. But then again, I guess, um, you know, sharing my, this is my interpretation of, of that sure. experience. You know, I can't argue with what Unilever thinks about it now. But for me personally, I'm very proud of, of, of that particular role and what I did um, and at the time that I was doing it. Fantastic. So what, going through, I'm sure that along that journey, it wasn't easy, especially on such a, with such a huge organization. What were some of the sort of challenges that you came across in, in, in putting that together? Um, I guess firstly, because every, everybody has an opinion. And of course, HR, we always <laughs> have the best about ourselves. <laughs> Um, I think the challenge for me was really helping our HR folk understand that the role of HR was changing and that, you know, it's not good enough for us to uh, try to do everything. And and that whole separation of strategic business partnering Mm -hmm. with HR operations and, 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 you know, helping our understand that actually HR operations and the process stuff is almost our license to operate. If you get the bread and butter of HR wrong, don't try and expect to be a strategic business partner. (laughs) Mm. So I think the big challenge was, was also helping HR professionals recognize that actually a strategic business partner has very different skills to somebody who does HR operations. It's pulling on different muscles and actually it's okay to not try to do both of those roles because if, we, if one tries to do both, you inevitably fail. Mm. So helping, helping uh, a lot of the HR in, you know, organization understand that there's, it's actually necessary to separate those activities because it's different skills mm. and that it's okay. And that we every, actually all of the HR roles are critical to delivering HR, but it's not necessary to want to do both and, and helping people let go and, and equally, Helping uh, HR folk understand that if they're not good at one part, then maybe they should opt out of doing the other part. Because in the past, obviously, we did both operational and tried yeah. to add value to the business. And we all know that that's not good enough. Mm-hmm. So wow. that, that's some of the challenges. Yeah, I think a lot of businesses are still going through that shift of mentality and that change of mindset. How, how did you approach that in terms of... Um re-educating and getting people to think more broadly and become self-aware of their own skill sets and where they can add value? Well, I guess we developed an HR career framework, which helped people understand firstly the differences in what the roles brought and the skills required to do those roles. Um, And, and we, we held, um, you know, some career you know, it's kind of, we held some workshops that help people mm-hmm. think through what are the differences in the roles and what path do they want to follow? Because the decision you make is quite different depending on the route in HR you want to go, but equally helping people understand that some of the skills are transferable and that it's probably best to get some of that HR operational experience at the foundation of your career rather than trying to do the strategic stuff first, because you do need the bread and butter of HR uh, in order to do a strategic role, because you need to, to, to be able to understand it. Both sides, yeah. In order to do it. Mm-hmm. So I think by, by having that career framework, educating people about the differences in roles, and then on the flip side, uh, having programs available for those who do want to, you know, we focused on the strategic business partnering aspect at the time when I was there, rather than trying to develop all the skills because the biggest gap we had at the time was the strategic business partnering skills, which is about really operating as a consultant and diagnosing business problems, designing the organization, asking the right questions that's going to help drive business value. So the focus was about, you know, helping people understand the difference in roles and what's required, but equally offering some development programs that will enable people to deliver uh, against those requirements so I, those are just two things that fantastic we fantastic so on that point it leads us quite nicely so what what's uh, we we both know that the the skill set of a hr leader is changing dramatically um yeah. or has changed quite dramatically over the especially in the 10 years i've been it, been speaking to you guys yeah. um what hr skills do you believe will be more important in the future moving forward um 
Well, I guess if you just, I, mean, I guess for me, there's three things, strategic workforce planning, org design and building capabilities faster and uh, recruiting from different types of talent pools. But there's context to this. So mm -hmm. if I may just elaborate on sure. that. I guess if you look at the increasing competitive landscape and the shifts in technology that's driving change at a, at a rapid pace, whether we like it or not, we need to strengthen our capabilities at, at, within the HR function to be able to do better strategic workforce planning, but planning much further out into the future, but equally how to build those capabilities. So we need to be able to spot what are those future capabilities and what do we need to do to address those capabilities. But the trick is being able to do it much faster mm -hmm. than we have in the past. We don't have the luxury of doing a 10-year plan and then taking five years to deliver it. We've really got to go faster. And then on the flip side of that, you know, you, if you look at a lot of companies are quite afraid of the impact of digital and technology. And, and you know, we really shouldn't be afraid, you know, whilst, yes, we know it's a fact that it replaces many of the activities that people do. However, new technologies actually open up new opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead, <laughs> we really need to recognize the challenge, you know, as, as the organization evolves, that we really just need to understand how could we firstly spot those new capabilities, but equally prepare the organization to migrate to those new capabilities. Um, and, and that's where I think, some of our org design skills come in, you know, we've got to be very clever and link that to strategic workforce planning um, and then ultimately building capabilities. We also know that because of all of the technology, you know, the example of the iPhone, you know, we didn't have to teach anybody how to use an iPhone or an iPad. It's true. Okay, so so yeah. as an HR organization, mm. let's capitalize on that and put some of our learning on the iPhone because, yeah. because yeah. if you use something that somebody has learned and naturally uses in what they do use on a day-to-day -day basis, how can we leverage that? So, you know, HR has to get very smarter. And I think the same thing would happen in recruitment. You know, in the pharmaceutical industry, we tend to hire people who have a science and technology background. Mm -hmm. But actually, we may have to recruit people from non-traditional uh, pools, people with greater digital or architecture or, you know, data uh, mining, you know, the more disruptive technologies where people are coming from different industries and, yeah. and look at people in a very different way um, into the future. So, I, I mean, I think technology for me is a wonderful opportunity for HR, but equally it's disruptive in the sense that we're going to have to be a lot faster. Fantastic. Sorry, a long way of telling you with the shifts in, in HR skills, but you know, those are some of the trends I'm spotting. No, certainly. And you're definitely reflecting what I'm hearing from your peers across the industry um, as well. I think uh, one of the key things now, which, you know, is, is, as you said before, you don't have 10 years to develop these strategies. People, the innovation's happening as we speak, you know, it's, it's not sort of, it's no longer a buzzword, it's, uh, it's happening. <laughs> and uh, you have to be, be able to keep up with the competition. So how are you currently um, preparing your team for this change? You mentioned a few things there, but how are you, what are you doing to prepare your team for these changes? Well, I guess, um, if you look at Astellas, Astellas is a Japanese company and, um, I say this all the time, but I say this with the greatest of respect. We are a little old fashioned in the way we do HR. And so uh, I know coming into this role, I've only been here a year. Um, I don't have 20 years to catch up and I really can't follow what other HR organizations have done step by step, because quite frankly, I'll be behind as I, I go along that journey. So some of the things that, that we're doing, you know, just to catapult us into the future as, as an example, um, we, um, we recently uh, did a 30 day challenge by sending leaders small bite sized activities through a web enabled platform that could be accessed by the, by the iPhone. And it's just really small bite sized little activities. And what we were trying to do is, is help our leaders increase their visibility. So mm -hmm. we gave little tips and hints, linked a couple of TED talks, uh, you know, some very simple techniques, just, you know, simple things like go out of your office and go and sit with your team. Um, but then more importantly, 
come back on the app and share how it felt, you know, share with your peer group of leaders how that happened. And so we set it up in a way that we created some healthy competition. There was a leaderboard. It was a group of leaders that are peers. Um, and we, we literally posted li really small chunks of suggestions as to how to do the simple things. Because very often as leaders, we forget to do simple things and, and learning has to be very, very simple. Mm. Now, it, it, given the comments I've made that be a little old fashioned, the fact that we did this like really catapulted us into the future. No, sure. So I'm really proud of that very simple thing we've done. It's mm. webinar. It's not even an app. A yeah. App, but it, it produced or the look and feel was like an app. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's just one little example of how we can make leadership development exciting, simple, bite-sized, and, and not overwhelming. I think people undervalue those small things that you can do. You said that's a small thing, but in my mind, it's a huge thing because not only are you getting your senior leadership to talk to each other and they're going to build relationships across the business and understand, oh, mate, I'm actually also having that tra tra trouble. I'm not the only one in your organization. Um, you know, or, or, or you have someone, as you say, coming back with a positive response to one of those challenges and then almost challenges the rest of the guys to go out there and also take that approach. So I think that's a huge huge step in the right direction to be able to and as you said you're leveraging mobile technology to be able to do this and as you know the adoption rate is going to be huge because everyone's going to be on their mobile using it and it almost feels natural now for people to communicate on that platform doesn't it with whatsapp with facebook with linkedin people are really open now to, uh, to share vulnerabilities and their insights in a mobile world whereas if you try to if you try to get those guys in one room <laughs> <laughs> to all talk about that then it just just wouldn't work so re really good to hear that, that you're doing um that you're doing stuff like that in the organization um one of the big things that i talk about with our members and it's an ongoing conversation nothing new here but in your career what have you found to be the most effective ways of of engaging with the rest of the business you know part of a successful hr leader is being able to communicate with the stakeholders throughout the organization it's a huge part, really, as we all know. What, what kind of um, effective ways have you found to communicate with your leadership team and to really understand the business beyond HR? Yeah, um, at the moment, there is just so much going on in, in our particular business. You know, we face some, some really big challenges. So I guess one of the things I'm constantly mindful of is that our team is overwhelmed with so much activity data you know not just information you know data generally and so what i found that you know at the moment given our current climate it's the basics that are making a difference you know mm. the good old-fashioned walking over to speak to a colleague just underrated <laughs> it's underrated how it's underrated but you yeah. know just doing that I, I get the answer immediately mm. you know Sometimes just saying, look, we've got a bit of a problem here. Let's just have, let's just 30 minutes, not asking for a lot of your time, just 30 minutes. Let's kind of brainstorm, brainstorm and, and kind of just work through the problem together. And, and I found that by doing these quick little 30 minute brainstorm sessions, it, it actually helps me align the, the individual or the couple of team members um, and, and build a, a much better understanding of the issue that we were grappling with, you know, just getting a quick phone call set up. Uh, you know, I, I use uh, text a lot when we, there's lots of, we get lots of email traffic. Mm -hmm. So I literally send a text and I say, could you have a look at X? This is urgent. And I only use it if it's urgent. Mm -hmm. And that way, because we all have hundreds of emails every day, it mm -hmm. just helps, you know, so my noise. colleagues prioritize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess on the on on the flip side, you know, we've this year was just fortunate. We we almost a brand new leadership team, all of us. Oh um, wow! Not one of us have been in our roles for more than uh, I would say eighteen months, starting with our president in April last year. Um, you know, we we've just gone through our midterm planning, so we we did our three to five year strategy, and we said we're going to do that the old fashioned way because firstly we're a new team. But secondly, because it's going to enable us to build a much better understanding of the business and the challenges we face. So we had a lot of meetings in the last few months. You wouldn't normally do this, but given where we are as a leadership team, we took the opportunity to spend time getting to know each other, but equally having some really tough discussion about the tough choices we would have to make 
to get the business, uh, you know, moving mm-hmm. forward and, and to deliver our three to five year strategy. And then I guess another example of, of engaging, which is slightly broader than the leadership team itself, was we recently held a conference with our top 200 leaders in EMEA. And one of the techniques we used is, uh, so we, you know, we, we obviously were sharing our midterm strategy with them. Um, and we said, well, these are the high level aspirational statements. This is what we're heading towards. But instead of actually telling them what the strategy was and the bore, dull, boring numbers, we actually shared with them a couple of tools to say, well, in your affiliates and in your part of the business, these are the aspirational statements, but here are some tools to help you make choices about your part of the world. You are all leaders. We're not going to tell you the strategy, but we're going to give you some tools to make some choices. And then I guess after giving them an opportunity to play with these uh, tools and, mm-hmm. and little simple techniques, we then said, right, you've heard about our aspirational statements. We've told you what you're going to go and back to your businesses and do to help you come up with your three to five year strategy that will reinforce our three to five year plan. Um, Let's now work as a group, 200 of us, and co-create what are we going to tell our people in terms of what the strategy is. So we used storytelling. Mm. So we brought in some professional storytellers um, and it's an, an amazing experience when you get 200 leaders to co-create the story of how are we going to communicate our strategy. And so the the storytellers group, very professional, they helped us with the critical chapters of our story and we co-created. And at the end of that two hour session of co-creating how we would talk to our businesses about the strategy, um, the vote around how confident we felt about the story we co-created was, I would say, a seven out of 10, which is amazing considering we spent two hours on it. Sure. But that was the, the baseline that we've taken away and we're going to further refine and develop. And then we're going to cascade with one voice through the business. So that's another example of something that we've done. And I given think, the old fashioned Astellas organization, that's really modern. <laughs> no, I think that's very, very interesting because I think, well, first and foremost, um, uniquely, you've empowered every single person in that room, right? And uh, you've given them, they've, they've got some ownership, you know? They're not just going in the room being told, this is how you guys are going to, uh, this is the story moving forward, go out there and uh, do that. You've engaged them in the process, you've empowered, you've, you've included them in that process. And of course, they're going to walk away feeling much more um, attached to that story and everyone's going to walk away telling the same story to organization. And that's the biggest challenge, biggest challenge for all the people I speak to is to make sure everyone's aligned. It's so powerful when you have everyone in this going in the same direction, telling the right story um, to all the way down throughout the business. So I can certainly see how that was a, um, it was a, I don't, I wouldn't say it was a risk actually. I think it's very, it's very refreshing that you took that approach rather than, young, rather than the, the normal approach of getting everyone in a room for a strategy meeting and telling them this is where we're going and then hoping everyone walks out the door inspired and, and, and you know, goes off and, and tells, because, you know, it doesn't work, does it? Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't. So on, on that... don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> no, exactly. Especially with the type of people you have in the room. They're all leaders, you know. At some, to some extent, they're all going to have some sort of ego and, you know, they're going to... But they want to be feel like they're included and that they're... they're their experience and their insights are valued etc so i think that's a great approach and i think a lot of other leaders can learn from that so thank you for sharing that um so lastly um i think one of the one of the key things is based on everything you said then and having that meeting you're coming into the new role with the new leaders in the business is very unique actually um to have not only you joining the business but other management team and and building that strategy from all of that, where do you see the biggest opportunity for improvement in the business? Um, and, and how can you and the HR help the, the business get there? Yeah, I think the biggest opportunity is really building leadership capability um, and, and ultimately strengthening the organizational culture. And, and the reason why I say that is because Estella Samia has grown rapidly over the past 10 years. And I, I guess the profile of the leaders we had um, in the past, and we still have many of them today, this, the strengths that they had probably were fit for 10 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, some of the challenges we face are as a direct result of the business has evolved. 
uh, things have changed and, and ultimately the capability we require to take this business forward is a bit different. So it's not that people are not great. It's just simply that the business has evolved mm -hmm. and we need to sharpen and strengthen our leadership capability. And so there's a big shift in the leadership capability required in this business. Um, and so, you know, my team are working really hard, firstly, on helping people understand that gap. You know, we've done a lot of assessment, helping people understand motive, getting the balance right of motivating, but equally helping people self top in terms of, well, I don't have the skills for the future and it may not be me, um, to helping simplify what are the expectations of our leaders right through to um, you know, being clear about what we expect of the new cadre of leaders to help us transform this business. It's safe to say we have a burning platform for change. <laughs> I don't need to say any more the fact that the whole leadership team is changing exactly. the message. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's an exciting opportunity. And, and, and that's why, for me, the biggest challenge and opportunity is our leadership capability and shifting um, to, to meet the demands of the future it doesn't mean our people that we've had were, were all wrong. Actually, quite far from that. I understand. Yeah. The world has changed. Yeah, the world has changed and the needs of the business have evolved. So the, the employees and the workforce and the skill set need to evolve to match that. Um, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, look, that leads us pretty nicely on to what we call the quick fire round, where I'm going to ask you five questions and you have no more than 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> um, what was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a, a senior HR leader? The confidence that I'm ready and I have the skills and experiences to do the job. Yeah, I think we all share that one. Uh, <laughs> what's the best uh, piece of business advice you've ever received? Um, I guess develop the people around you uh, to be able to do your job. Don't be afraid of making yourself redundant because new opportunities will always find you. Fantastic. Uh, what's one book that you would recommend to our uh, audience and why? Um, what Got You Here Won't Get You There by Marshall Goldsmith. Um, I mean, it looks at behavioral problems and not technical skills are really what separate the great from the near great. Um, and the first step is really about, the first step is changing, is about wanting to change. Um, and those are the two reasons why, you know, this book is so important. Mm -hmm. I think Marshall's going to have to come on the show now because uh, <laughs> I think every, every two or three episodes that book's getting mentioned. So he, he's obviously hit a nerve there, isn't he? Um, <laughs> could you share one internet resource that you use to, um, you know, keep yourself up to date with current events and, and stay in tune? I'd have to cheat and give you two LinkedIn and Ted talks. Yeah. The two's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly they're, they're, they're the two most popular and for me too so definitely if, if 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 you're a hr leader and you haven't looked you haven't watched ted talks or you're not on linkedin then there's some great information there that you're missing out on of course absolutely as well um what's one thing about your business this is a hard one what's the most one thing about your business that most excites you today well, an exciting announcement was made about a phase three study. Um, and, you know, as part of our ongoing commitment to clinical development in terms of meeting unmet needs, uh, Estellas, together with his partner Pfizer, initiated a, an early stage prostate cancer, uh, obviously clinical trial to assess, you know, where we know there's no... Um, approved treatment in this area. So the fact that we're doing a mm -hmm. clinical trial in that particular area is just so exciting. Wow. Fantastic. Very exciting. And um, I suppose uh, f from that point of view, um, you've given us some amazing advice. So really, really thank you for that. And I know our members will be a lot better off for it. So I really appreciate your time taking the time to join us. Give our listeners one parting piece of guidance and also the best way to connect with you if they have any questions. I think my parting advice would be don't say no to new things. Start by asking why not. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And the best way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, look, thank you again for joining us. Um, guys, make sure you head over to hrdleaders.com. There you'll find all of the show notes on the episode, everything we've been talking about, timestamps, links, resources, etc. Uh, Rochelle, thank you again for sharing your journey with HR leaders and I wish you all the best until we next speak. It's my pleasure.